I grew up on a beef farm in Missouri, and like everybody else that raises livestock, we had to raise a lot of our own feed to stay in business economically. And we raise corn and soybeans and hay, and you grind this material up into a flour, you make pellets, you add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals to this pellet, and you feed those calves for about six to nine months before you ship them off to market, maybe to be butchered, maybe to other feeders, and you always save back the very best ones for yourself, and you knock them in the head and eat them. It's a real simple cycle on the farm. The thing that fascinated me as a teenager was that as a family, we lived out of the same fields. We kept back five rows of corn for ourselves. We had a garden at the end of the field where we grew our peas and beans and squash and tomatoes. And we wanted to live to be 100 with no aches and pains, yet we didn't give ourselves the same vitamins and minerals and trace minerals that we gave the livestock. This whole concept really fascinated me, and I went on to ag school at the University of Missouri, and there I learned about uh, chemistry, soil chemistry, and how it related to tons and bushels per acre. I learned about ag economics, but I really didn't get an answer to my basic question, why did we give these calves vitamins and minerals and trace minerals and not ourselves, until I became a freshman veterinary student at the University of Missouri. And there I learned that the reason why we put all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds, bottom line, is because we don't have health insurance for them. And of course, if we were to use uh, a human healthcare type of uh, system for livestock, it'd be a sticker shock for you. Uh, your, your hamburger cost would be $275 a pound. Boneless, skinless chicken breasts would be $450 a pound, and a dozen eggs would be $50 for a dozen eggs. So we learned that we could keep the price of animal products, such as meat and dairy and poultry and eggs, down to where the average American could afford them, simply by reducing or eliminating health care costs. And we do this in animals by preventing and curing diseases with nutritional formulas. Now, that whole concept fascinated me all through veterinary school. And while the other vet students were playing bridge and throwing horseshoes during breaks, I spent a lot of my time in the library studying more nutrition. After graduating vet school, I went to Africa for two years and got to work with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom days. And that was kind of a kick. I got to play Frank Buck and trudge all over Central and South Africa uh, using the tranquilizer gun and moving elephants and rhino all over the continent of Africa and Europe and the United States. And after two years, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to the States to work on a big project. He'd actually gotten a $7.5 million grant from the National Institutes of Health, and this was to study pollution, the environment, and the ecology. This was more than 35 years ago. And my job as the wildlife veterinarian on the project was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos around the United States. And I was supposed to identify a species of animals that were ultra-sensitive to pollution. And we're going to use that animal much like the old coal miners used to use canaries. Remember how that story goes? They take the canaries down into the mine, and if methane gas or carbon monoxide were to leak into the mine, the canaries were more sensitive than men, and they would drop off the perch and die long before the men were in danger of suffocating or blowing up. Well, to make a long story short, after some 12 plus years working directly with Perkins at the St. Louis Zoo, the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, the National Zoo in DC, LA Zoo, and many other large zoos around the United States, I had done some 17,500 autopsies on over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings for a comparison. And what I learned was that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. And I got all excited about nutrition again, and I wrote 75 scientific papers that were in medical journals and veterinary journals, international pathology journals. I wrote uh, some 15 chapters for eight multi-authored textbooks. I wrote a textbook of my own that was 1,000 pages and 2,000 illustrations. And through the news releases of the large universities I worked with, I was on 2020 with Hugh Downs and Geraldo before he uh, got his nose broke for the first time. And through the news releases, again, through the universities, I was in some 1,700 newspapers around the world through the UPI and AP Newswire service. And with all this public exposure and with all the scientific exposure, I couldn't get people who are in a position of authority, either in medical research or in government, to get too excited about preventing and curing diseases in human beings with nutrition like we did in animals. So I got frustrated enough, I went back to school up in Portland, Oregon, became a physician, and I practiced there for 12 years as a general family practitioner, and I used everything that I had learned in veterinary nutrition in my human patients. And of course, this was uh, no surprise to me that the concept works just as well in people as it does in animals. There are 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and three essential fatty acids, and they're called essential nutrients for two reasons. Number one, our bodies cannot manufacture them. We must consume these essential nutrients every day, either as food or as a supplement. 
Number two, if any one of these 90 essential nutrients is missing for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of years, you get on the average 10 deficiency diseases. 10 deficiency diseases times 90 essential nutrients, that's 900 diseases that are preventable with proper supplementation. And the nice thing about this concept is, if you have any of these 900 deficiency diseases and you supplement properly, you have every honest expectation of getting some significant benefit. Many people will get 100% better. Then, we haven't had to think about this over the years as, as since human beings have been on Earth, simply because our food plants, our grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, have been able to manufacture the vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And this whole concept was very interesting to researchers back in the 30s and 40s. They believed that you could get everything you needed from your four food groups because plants did manufacture vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And that's where that whole malignant, dumb belief came from, that you could get everything you needed from your four food groups. And of course, that little sentence has killed more Americans than all the foreign enemies put together in the 220 years we've been a nation. Now, you notice I didn't talk about minerals. Minerals are a different concept. Minerals cannot be manufactured by plants, as we've already said. And as a result, you have to consciously supplement with minerals. You can get some vitamins. You can get some vitamin A and beta carotene and vitamin C and vitamin E from your grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts, but you cannot get minerals. You cannot guarantee you're going to get minerals, so you must supplement with minerals for this reason. How important are minerals? Well, they're used as cofactors for vitamins. You cannot use vitamins without mineral cofactors. You cannot use uh, enzymes. You cannot use hormones. You cannot use DNA, RNA, chromosomes. You cannot even use oxygen without mineral cofactors. That's how important they are. Secondly, minerals do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. Minerals occur in veins like chocolate ripple ice cream. And you know that chocolate ripple ice cream is 99% vanilla and it's just 1% chocolate. And here's our problem. Plants cannot manufacture minerals. Minerals do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. They make up two-thirds of the 90 essential nutrients. 60 minerals out of 90 nutrients, two-thirds of the 90 essential nutrients are minerals. That's how important they are. Now, one of the things that cause problems in addition to plants being able to, not being able to manufacture minerals and minerals not occurring in a uniform blank around the crust of the earth is that we've used a simple fertilizer for the last 100 years in the United States called NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And the simple fertilizer gave the farmers the maximum yield in terms of tons and bushels per acre. Nobody gave a farmer any kind of tax break or cash incentive to make sure that you and I got all 60 essential minerals. That's our own responsibility. Farmers grew tons and bushels. Now, one of the things I want you to pick up, one of the things I want you to get, is a copy of U.S. Senate Document 264. U.S. Senate Document 264 says that there's no longer any nutritional minerals left in our farm and range soils. And as a result, the grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts that are grown there are minerally deficient. And as a result, the animals and people who eat these minerally deficient grains, vegetables, fruits, and nuts get mineral deficiency diseases. And the only way to prevent and cure them is with mineral supplementation. Now, to me, the scary thing about U.S. Senate Document 264 is that it was written and published in 1936. 1936. And at that time, we began to put vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds to make up the difference. And, uh, of course, uh, since that time, we've been able to prevent and cure all kinds of diseases in animals with these nutritional formulas. Unfortunately for human beings, we got wonder drugs in 1936. We got sulfa drugs in 36. We got penicillin in 38, and we got cortisone in 42, and it was very easy for the medical profession to con the American public into believing they would find a wonder drug f to fix everything. If we just gave them enough money for research, and if we faithfully watched Dr. Marcus Welby, MD, uh, that they would find a wonder drug to fix everything. Well, you don't believe that anymore. That's why you're, um, that's why you're here, because you don't believe this anymore. You cannot get everything you need from your four food groups, and you must, and you must supplement with your vitamins and your minerals. There are five early warning symptoms that even a five-year-old can recognize when you have mineral deficiencies that are dangerous and life-threatening. Number one is white, gray, and silver hair. White, gray, and silver hair indicates a copper deficiency because copper is required to manufacture hair pigment. doesn't matter if your hair uh, or color, if your original hair color is uh, blonde or red or brown or black. Copper is required as a cofactor to manufacture this hair color. So if you have white, gray, or silver hair, you actually have a copper deficiency. Now, if this was just a cosmetic problem, it'd be no worry, but there are more sinister things going on when you have a copper deficiency. Copper is also required 
as a cofactor to manufacture the elastic fibers in your body, including the elastic fibers in veins and arteries. When you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers